Anyways, good morning. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and say good morning and how much you're glad to see them. Were they doing it again? Wait, do it again. Let me see if I can fix it. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, no. Okay. We're, okay, whatever. I think I just changed the colors. I don't think I stopped it. Hold on. Wait, hold on. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, maybe we, they, these are flashing too. Maybe we should turn them all off. <laughs> you can turn these ones on though. If, I don't know if they're plugged in. I don't know. You know what? I am not an electrician, guys. I don't know if you knew that, but I work with little children. That's about as far as my skills go. So, <laughs> good morning. Obviously, I am not Jonathan. Um, Jonathan would have probably made that a lot funnier than I did, but. Anyways, they are on their way back. They are helping someone move here. And so today you got me. You know, I know you're so excited about that. <laughs> you know, I was like, Josh, do you want to preach? And he was like, I did it last time. And I was like, I bet they want you to preach because you get them out of here earlier. But you get me. And I'm long-winded just like Jonathan. So, But I will say, look, I only have like this. But it's the in-between parts that you got to worry about, so we'll see. <laughs> um, but anyways, today, I want to talk to you about the topic of reboot or restart. And taking what, where your life is now, kind of the cards that you've been dealt in your life, and maybe restarting in some areas or restarting in all the areas, because I don't, I don't know where you are today. Like, I don't know where your life is at today. And I don't know, some of you I know where you came from. I know a little bit of your background. But a lot of you, I probably don't know, like, the deep, dark things that really happened to you in, in your past or the things that you've been through. And so I wanted to talk about the topic of restarting because a lot of us probably have stuff in our past or things that were done to us or things that maybe you chose to do that you wish you could take back or you wish never happened or you wish that Jesus got a hold of you a little bit sooner before you did what you did or saw what you saw. And so that's kind of where I want to go today. Um, you know, I was thinking, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about my family. But before I do, I want to ask this question, you know, have you ever thought, like, why, why was I put in the family that I was put in? Why, why did God choose to put me into my family. Now, you could ask that question for a whole different reason than me. Your upbringing might not have been awesome. Um, it might not have been something that you enjoy thinking about. Um, for me, you know, I had, I had a really good family. Um, we had our moments. Obviously, no family is perfect. But I can say, like, the only times I've ever really thought that is when I sit back and think, I have to be adopted. Like, you just think of all the funny moments and the ridiculous things that happen to you, and you think, there's no way that I'm legitimately a part of this family. <laughs> like, you just think, what is happening? Like, you're the normal one, right? And so that's, like, when I think of that question, I think, I am, like, the only normal one in this family. But they probably think that I'm not the normal one. So I want to introduce you a little bit to my family. So the first picture... Um, is that's that's my family, like my immediate family. So it's it's a little hard to see. So can you go to the next one? Legitimately, that's the okay. All these pictures are from Facebook, so because nobody has real pictures anymore. So that last picture was the only picture that I found of like all four of us together. So that is me and my brother. That was the day before his wedding. I have one brother, and he is two and a half years older than me, and. If you go back to that other picture, that first picture, so let me, let me give you a little backstory here. Every year, my mother would take a Christmas card picture. It never really had to be fancy. It just had to be all of us in it. <laughs> and so, and I had to put my cat in it because I love cats. But um, and my mom, the reason why it was hard for me to find a picture of all of us is because my mother is the picture taker. She is never in any pictures. Like, I struggled to find this picture because she's never in any pictures. So if you go to not, the next one is me and my brother, and then the one after that, that's my mom and dad. So um, 
and everybody says, you look just like your mom. Okay, for the record, my mom used to have brown hair, so then we really looked alike, but she dyed her hair blonde, and that's where it is now. But that's my mom and my dad. So I come from a, like, typical all-American family, I guess, like one boy, one girl, mom and dad. And I can say, like, my parents were married until the day my dad died. They were married for 30 years. Um, I lived in the exact same house almost my entire life. I never moved. The only time we ever moved was when my parents got married and me and my brother were born. We lived in one house, which is the house my dad, I, I think my dad owned before my parents got married. We literally moved down the street and around the corner to my grandpa's house that my mom inherited when he died. And we lived there until I moved to Indiana. My mom still lives there. So like, I never moved. My parents always had a job. Like, we weren't like rich. We were middle class family. Everything was stable, normal. Like, I don't have much to complain about when it comes to my family. The only thing that we didn't do was go to church. Like, I was not raised in church. So the fact that I'm standing here, a licensed pastor, and regularly involved in church, you know, a Jesus-loving Christian, it's not crazy out of, like, out of the way for me to be able to do that, but I was not raised that way. Like, we didn't wake up every Sunday morning and go to church as family. And if, like, legit, I am the only person in my family probably besides my grandfather that is in church right now on a Sunday morning. My brother has nothing to do with church. My brother does not believe in God. He is the exact opposite of me, actually. And my parents' friends will say that. They'll be like, how did you get such opposite children? Because my brother wants nothing to do with God. So I, for the most part, it's, it's a little bit of a miracle that I'm a Christian standing here as a pastor right now because that's not how I was raised. Because even though I, had, I have wonderful parents, they worked hard their whole life. They taught me and my brother great values of working hard and, you know, doing what we have to do to pay our bills and take care of our family. And they took care of us my whole life. My mom still takes care. She, like, she tries to pay my bills still. Like, she'll, be, she'll be like, I'll pay for it for you. Or I'm like, Mom, you know I got a job, right? Like, I can buy my own dinner. And she's like, no, I'm buying your dinner. And it's like a mom thing. <laughs> and I'm like, so... So, like, she still tries to take care of me because I'm her baby. But I was not raised in a church family. So if you go to the next picture, these are my grandparents. These are my dad's parents. So you're, you're getting the Judd side of the family. That's, that's my maiden name is Judd. So this is my dad's parents. And I will say, if it was not for them, I would not be here because they are the church-going, Jesus-loving people. And if it was not for their prayers and their faithfulness and their example, I, I would, I'm sure that I would still be an okay person, but I wouldn't be in church. Because I can honestly tell you that they prayed for me before I was even born, before I was even in my mom's stomach, any of that, because... They have been raised that way. And so if you go to the next picture, I'll go back even further. And that little lady is my granny. Her name is Mildred. She is my great-grandmother. That's my grandpa from the last picture. That's her son. She lived until she was 95, I think. I was in my 20s when she died. And she is the one that started it all. She, she raised my grandfather and her children in a godly heritage and took them to church, read, read the Bible to them, prayed with them, and lived the way that they should have lived in a Christ-like way and raised him to be that way. And for whatever reason, it skipped a generation with my dad and his brothers. But still to this day, like if it wasn't for her and if it wasn't for my grandparents, I wouldn't be in church. I wouldn't know Jesus like I know Jesus. I would know of Jesus because my parents, when I say this, my parents are not bad people. My parents are wonderful people. They are 
nice and kind and giving and a lot of things, but they didn't take me to church. Like, we should be taken to church as children. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't say that in a bad way. Um, but if it wasn't for these two, if it wasn't for my grandmother praying for me and, you know, interceding for me when I didn't even know that I needed it, because I remember as a teenager, I would go to church with them sometimes, and there would be days where I was like, I don't want to wake up early, so I'm just going to sleep. And my grandma would call me and be like, are you going to church with us? And I'm like, uh, not today. I'm too tired. And she would be like, well, then I'll pray for you. And I'm like, what you praying for me for? Like, I'm just tired. But, like, if it wasn't for her, I would not have overcome the things that I've overcome and continued in my relationship with Christ. Because what I've noticed is, is that it's easy to slip away when that thing isn't, like, of the utmost importance. So you can go ahead and go back to um, the graphic. So I showed you that because, you know, my life wasn't terrible. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that my parents were awful. And, you know, that's not where I was at in life. Like, my parents were wonderful. But I sometimes wish that I had that, that family that, like, okay, we're going to wake up and we're going to go to church. And you're not allowed to watch that. Like, I say this now, but when I was a teenager, I wouldn't have liked it. But, like, you're not allowed to watch that because it's not appropriate for you. It's not, you know, it's not a Christ-like thing for you to watch or it's not a good thing for you to listen to because I didn't have that. I was allowed to watch whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. I mean, to a certain extent. Like, I wasn't watching anything super inappropriate. But, like, you know, and music, it wasn't that big of a deal to listen to whatever. And so I... I didn't have that example of, you know, that biblical example that I would have desired now as an older person who is, like, so in love with Jesus. And I was like, man, I wish I had, like, that from the beginning because I feel like I've missed out. But at the same time, like, God gave me a fresh new start. But the thing is, like, I had to choose that fresh new start because like I told you, my brother, my brother is a great man. He is a great father, a great husband. He works hard for his family. And, but at the same time, he has nothing to do. Like when I say nothing to do with God, like if I bring it up, he's like, I don't want to hear it, Stephanie. Or I must have like judgmental eyes or something because my whole family's like, don't judge me. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Are you feeling convicted? Because I'm not judging you. <laughs> like so that's just where I come from. So I wanted to read you guys a story from the Bible and talk about how restarting from wherever you're at, maybe you've already restarted, maybe like you're ahead of the game, and what I'm saying to you is like, yeah, I've already done this. Well, good. I'm glad that you are ahead of the game. But if you're not, I want you to evaluate where you're at because just because you were raised a certain way or just because you have made choices that have directed your life in a certain way does not mean that you are stuck where you're at. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you anymore. It doesn't mean that God is done with you or he's had enough of your mistakes and that he doesn't want to deal with you anymore. That's not how that works. Because there are so many examples in the Bible. I can give you examples from my life because even though my grandparents and my great-grandmother were praying for me and were being that example for me, I didn't make the best choices all the time, you know? I went down paths that I probably shouldn't have went down, but God wasn't done with me. God's not done with you. And through all of your stuff, through the way that you were raised, through everything, God is not done with you. God is not done with your life. You know, he's not giving up on you. And so that's what I want to encourage you guys with today. And if you have your Bibles, I want to read, starting in Acts chapter 8. I'm going to read a little bit today, so I'm sorry if you guys are like, oh, she's reading too many scriptures. But, you know, the Bible is true, so we're going we're gonna to hear what the Bible has to say today. I want to tell you a story about Paul, who used to be Saul, and I want to tell you about his life. Because I've worked with teenagers for a long time in youth ministry, and I work with kids at my school, and 
I've heard teenagers say to me, well, God can't forgive me for what I've done. But I want to focus on Saul because, you know, it doesn't matter how terrible something you have done, it, like, is in your mind. God can forgive the worst of the worst. God can push you forward and push you past your worst, anything that you've ever done, anything you've ever been through. And I want to encourage you guys with that today. So we're going to start in Saul, cha- or Saul, <laughs> that's not what it's called, Acts chapter 8. And it's going to tell you a little bit about Saul. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. And it says, <clears throat> Saul agreed with putting him to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house and drag men off, men and women off, and put them in prison. So the beginning of that is a little weird because it says Saul agreed with putting him to death. So what that is talking about is in the previous chapter, what happened was, this is, this is right after Jesus ascended into heaven, and Stephen was martyred. He was killed for his faith in Jesus. He was the first martyr in, in the Bible that we know of. And so what it's saying is that Saul agreed with putting him to death. So Saul was this man. He was a Pharisee. He was extremely knowledgeable in Hebrew law and in Old Testament law and things like that. He was a very wise man, and he was a very powerful man because what he would do is he would take people who believed in Jesus, people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, who followed Christ and what he taught, and he would throw them in prison, or he would advocate killing them. He was a murderer. And so it's not just like, though, he was like this terrible person who was a psychopath. No, he knew the scriptures. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the law to like down to the letter. He knew, he knew it all. He was a very intelligent man, but he was so against Jesus and what Jesus had come to do that he thought what he was doing was the right thing. He thought that these people, these Christ followers, were not doing what the Bible wanted them to do. They were breaking Old Testament law. And so he decided that he was going to take the matters into his hands and he was going to persecute these Christians because he thought that is what he should have been doing. And so he was a mean guy. He was not nice. He was not a good Christian man. Even though he knew the scriptures, he knew the law. He was not a good person. And so if we turn over to uh, Acts chapter 9, one chapter over, I'm going to read verses 1 through 19. So bear with me here for a second. It says, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and he requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he traveled, he was nearing Damascus. A light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, that, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing, and, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and, threw his, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus, and he was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain sight. Lord, Ananias said, I have heard from many people about this man, how much he has done, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. 
And Ananias went and entered the house, and he placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you are traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at once something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And so here we see how... Saul had the authority to persecute these people because all the Pharisees and all the, the religious leaders thought these people that were following Christ were doing something wrong. They didn't believe that Christ was, was the Messiah. Obviously, they're the ones who crucified him. And so Saul was so zealous and Saul was so a part of the team of let's get all these Christians and either kill them or arrest them or persecute them in some way so that they change their mind and they come back to the right way of thinking. And so you can see here that Saul was still breathing threats is what it says. And then Jesus showed up on the scene for him. And then Jesus is like, okay, Ananias, you're going to go and you're going to, you're going to help. You're going to do my work. You're going to help him regain his sight. And then he's going to go and do all this great and wonderful stuff. But you can see Ananias is like, wait a minute now, because I've heard about this dude, and he is not nice. And so Ananias is like, I don't know if I should go here. Like, are you sure this is what you want? And he was obedient. He did what God wanted him to do. And it changed Saul's whole life. One moment of God coming down and showing Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I have great and wonderful plans for you. Even the worst of the worst. I mean, a murderer, a hateful man who didn't like Christ's followers because he thought he was right. Even, and he wasn't perfect. He didn't change his life before God used him. He was still a murderer and a mean person when God stopped him and changed his life. It wasn't like he had completely transformed his life and then God showed up on the scene. No, he was still a really mean person who didn't like Jesus. But Jesus changed his whole life. And then he went and he did all these wonderful and miraculous things for the, for the glory of God. And so I, I read that story to, to show you that it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what I've been through. It doesn't matter the mistakes you're making currently. Like, you could sit here and say, well, I didn't, ha like, I was raised in a church family, so I didn't really have a bad upbringing. You know, you might be struggling with something right now in your life. It might not be your past. It might not be the way that you were raised. It might not be, you know, the choices that your family made for you. It might be the choices that you've made recently. It might be you know, something that you are just stuck in and that you feel like you can't get out of. But I'm telling you that God will show up in the most perfect timing and he will use you no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how many mistakes you have made, no matter how much of a failure you feel like you are, no matter how much you think that you, you've screwed up so bad that you can never go back. No matter what people say to you, people might tell you that you're a failure. People might tell you you screwed up and you're going to screw up your whole life because your mom and your dad, they were screw ups too. You're going to be just like them. Or look at where you came from. Look at what you did. Look at what you chose to do. You made those choices. And people will tell you and tell you and tell you that you're nothing, that you can't, you're not good enough, that where you come from is not good enough. But I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter where you came from, that God can still use you. God can resurrect you and make you into a new person, a new creature, a new creation in him. Because Saul was a jerk, all right? If I was a Christian back then, I'd probably be hiding from him too because I wouldn't want him to kill me. And what happened was God transformed him before he could even realize what he was doing wrong. God transformed him and changed him into a new creature. And honestly, for almost the rest of the New Testament, it's Paul telling people about the goodness of Jesus. But the thing is, is that Paul chose to, to change. 
Because even though God did, like, blind his eyes and, you know, all that miraculous and crazy stuff, Paul still had to make the choice that he was going to follow Jesus. So we can be sitting here every single Sunday and listen to every single sermon that anybody that comes up here listens to or says. And you can listen to it all, right? You can, you can listen to all the Christian music you want. You can listen to every pastor on YouTube and you can read your Bible and do all this stuff. But at the end of the day, your choices, what you choose to do, it, it's on you. Because, like, I had the choice of, you know, in my upbringing, I went the complete opposite direction of my brother and my parents, you know, in, in, when it comes to church and Jesus and being a Christian. Because when I was younger, and I would go to church, and I would go to youth group with my friends, and I would listen to these pastors. I allowed it and decided that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm going to follow him. I'm going to live my life for him because if he died on the cross for my sins, if he made that sacrifice for me, even when I chose to act ridiculous and be rebellious, he still chose me even though he knew I was going to act ridiculous. And so I chose that I was going to live my life for him, that I was going to tell others about his goodness, and it was my choice. I didn't necessarily get raised in a terrible upbringing. I had loving parents, but I decided that I wanted to live my life for Jesus and that when I have children, I want to raise them to live their lives for Jesus. And so when we read this story about Paul, we got to think it's a choice. God can change your life. God can make you new. God can set you on a path where you do these great and miraculous things for his kingdom, for his glory, but you have to choose to do that. You have to choose to follow him. God's not going to force you to do that. And so um, the first thing that I want, the first point, I guess, that I have is the beginning of your story does not have to determine how it's going to end. And, and Paul's the perfect example of that because he thought he was doing the right thing. He thought that by persecuting these Christians that he was doing God a favor because he thought they were wrong. That he was following the scriptures of the Old Testament and that Jesus was not the Messiah. And so he was going to do God a favor by persecuting all these Christians and hopefully they would change their mind and go back to the way they were. But God changed his life so incredibly that the beginning of his story was not how the end of his story was. And even though he was a scary guy and some of the Christians were like, I don't think that I want to go and talk to him. Like, God, are you sure that's what you want me to do? And he ended up being one of the greatest Christians and changing all these people's lives because he decided that the, the beginning of his story was not how the end of his story was going to be. And that's how we have to be today. Some of you, I don't know, I know some of your stories. I don't know all of your stories. But I know that some of you have been through some stuff. Stuff that I can't even imagine. Stuff that I can't even understand. But I, I'm telling you that the beginning of your story is not how the end of it has to be. I work with little kids. Um, I've worked with little kids for like 10 years um, as my job. And I currently um, work on the, not, the most, it's not the most wholesome part of town. Um, it's not, not as scary as people made it out to be when I first started working there. But, I mean, there's some pretty interesting characters down that way. But um, I work with four, five, and six-year-olds. And you would be amazed at how some of these kids have done more, been through more stuff in their five years of existence than I probably ever will in my entire life. Um, I mean, I, I could tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories here. So, um, there's a young girl, she was in my class last year and, um, this year she was, I, I would see her in the hallway and stuff. And, um, she was four years old when she came to my, my class 
and she just graduated kindergarten, so she's going to be, she's six, she's going into first grade, and um, in her, now, in her four years when I, when I met her, so this is from uh, last year, I, I, I met her, and in her first four years of existence, her father had been murdered, um, and her mother had an infant baby who was her sister, and then her older sister, who was a teenager, had an infant baby, and they were all living in the same house, and she would come to school, and um, there were days where she'd be exhausted, and we would be like, you know, what's going on? And the, what it was is that she was her own caretaker. And so she didn't have a dad. She had her mom, who I, th I think her mom was just doing the best with the situation that she had. And her mom worked nights or, like, second shift or something like that. And so this four-year-old, she would have to wake up in the middle of the night and take care of her infant sister and I said, and I would say, well, why don't you wake up mom? Like, your, your sister's crying. Wake up your mom. And she's like, no, I'm not allowed. I have to take care of her. And so as, like, her story goes on, I would talk to her teacher from this year, and her teacher, would, it's the same thing. Except for now, it's she takes care of her sister, and she has to get herself up in the morning, and she has to make her own breakfast. And she, ha like, like, she would eat, like, random stuff for breakfast, not like Eggos, like, whatever she could make as a five-year-old. And so I think of girls like her, and I had a little boy like three or four years ago who his mom was murdered, and he got sent to his dad's who didn't really want him, and then um, his dad was so upset with his schooling like how bad, which he wasn't doing bad, which how, what, how bad he was doing, that one day he showed up to school and he couldn't sit down anymore because his dad beat him so bad with a belt. And it was just like this endless cycle. And, you, and I sit here and I think, these kids are five. Like, look at how their life is starting. And, I, and me and a coworker had a conversation about that, that young girl, and I was like, man, I really hope, I really pray that she breaks that cycle, that she grows up to be this independent, strong woman who, you know, goes to college or does something great with her life and just completely breaks that cycle because, like I said, her sister was a teenager in high school and had already had her first kid. But you think, like, you look at this and, like, there's cycles, and it's hard to break out of that cycle when that's all you know. And so... When you think about, think about your life, think about how you were raised, think about, you know, people may, you might know, it's easy to look down on people like that and be like, well, why don't you just change? Obviously, you didn't like the way you grew up. Why don't you just change? But it's not that easy. It's not that easy. And that's why we need the power of God in our lives to help us break those cycles. Because those things, if that's all you know, and that's all you keep doing. And so wherever you're at today, my first point that I want to encourage you with is that it doesn't matter how your story began. It matters how you finish. So if you began in an abusive situation, in an abusive home, or in a home where your parents didn't really care about you, or you didn't really have parents, or whatever it is, if your beginning was terrible, if your, you know, young adulthood was terrible, if you made terrible choices and you're like, I can never get over that. Like, I did something and I can never get through it. That's not true. God can take what you have done and he can show you grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. And he can turn you into this redeemed creation where you can glorify him and live for him and do great things for him. But you have to let those things go and move forward. You have to move forward in God. Because if you try to do it on your own, if you try to just, okay, God forgives me. You know, I love God. And that's it. You know, there's no, like, depth to the situation. We're just going to, I'm just going to say that I love God and you'll fall right back into it. 
You've got to let those things go, and you've got to move forward. But you've got to move forward with God. You've got to move forward and take steps with God. You can't just say, oh, I love God, but only on Sunday at church. No, you've got to live your life for God. You've got to live your life for Jesus and move forward with him. Allow him to change you, to, to mold you into the creation that he wants you to be. So, first point is don't allow your past to predict your future. Let God, let God change you and move you and mold you into who he wants you to be. My second point that I want you guys to remember as you're allowing God to change you is to run your race. So, um, sorry, I need to move that out of the way. Paul is one of the most amazing um, characters in the Bible that you can read about, that you can study about. And honestly, if you are in a place where you're like, God can't forgive me, you know, God can't forgive what I've done, I, w- I would encourage you to read Paul's letters and about Paul's life because he is one of those characters in the Bible, one of those people in the Bible that you can be like, I relate to that. If, if you think that God can't forgive you, I would encourage you to read his stuff. Um, I, want, I want to move over to Philippians chapter 3 just to give you a little bit, of, a little bit more of Paul's story. Um, so my second point is run your race. Not a literal race, because clearly, if you look at me, I don't run anywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> nope. I'm like Jonathan. If something's chasing me, I'll run. But I'm not running for fun. That is not fun. <laughs> um, so run your race means, like, if you allow God to transform your life, if you allow God to, to change you and mold you and shape you into what he's called you to be, then God has set a race before you. He has set a race before you that only you can do, that only you can accomplish. So what God has called you to do is not the same thing that God has called me to do. The one thing that we all have in common that God wants us to do is to reach out to those who are lost. But you might not be called to stand up here and hold a microphone and tell people about scriptures and things like that. Or you might not be called to go into the mission field. God has given you a specific race that you need to run. And so in Philippians 3, 12 through 14, it is Paul talking again. And he says, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I, have, I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do is forgetting what is behind me and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. So this is Paul telling us that he doesn't think that he's attained perfection. He's not like he's not a perfect person by any means. He has made his mistakes and made plenty of them. But what he does is he forgets what be, what is behind him and he reaches forward to what is ahead. If we want to run this race for Jesus, if we want to fully commit our lives to God, then we have to forget what is behind us and move forward and do what he has called us to do and run this race. I I don't know if you've heard this saying before, um, but they say, like, your rearview mirror is so much smaller than your windshield because you need to look forward more than you need to look backwards. Right? So, the one thing that the devil will try, and this is true in my life, so I'll just speak from experiences, is that Satan will continually bring up your past. When you think you've let it go, when you think it's over with, it'll be like, oh, remember when you did that? Or somebody, like, will pop up on, like, Facebook or, like, text me or whatever and be like, like somebody from my past and some, something that I don't want to remember that Jesus has far forgiven me for. Satan is good at using your past to, to make you feel guilty, to remind you of all the stupid, bad stuff that you've done. Sorry. Of all the bad stuff you've done. And so just know that guilt and your past coming up to you like that, that's not God. Because the Bible says that when God forgives you, it's as far as the east is from the west. There is no, like, returning 
Jesus isn't going to one day be like, oh, remember when I forgave you of that sin? That was a really bad sin. Like, that's not, that's not how Jesus works, guys. And so we need to listen to what Paul is saying when he says to leave what is in the past, what is behind, leave it behind. Leave it there. Don't bring it up. Don't keep asking God for forgiveness because when you ask God for forgiveness, you're forgiven. There is, there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ. God is not condemning you. He's not like holding it over your head and being like counting every single sin. Well, Ashley has asked forgiveness for like 200 sins and Claire has asked forgiveness for like 50 sins. Which one's more? Like that's not God. God doesn't, sorry, I don't, I don't have a record of your sins. I'm, you guys are just right here in the front. So, um, Because let's be real here. God doesn't weigh your sins by how many you've asked for forgiveness for. Like, you're not going to get to heaven and God's going to be like, well, let's look at the scale here. Let's see. You've passed the mark, so you're not getting in. Like, that's not how that works. When you ask for forgiveness, it's done. It's over with. It's washed in the blood of Jesus, and you move forward. So run your race and continue forward and show people the love of Christ, show people all the good things that he's done in your life, and forget about all the bad stuff that happened before Jesus. All right, because we all have bad stuff. Some stuff might be, like, really, really bad. Some stuff might not be so bad. But sin is sin. It doesn't, there's no scale. But the thing about sin is that you, when you're under the blood of Jesus, it's gone. It's, it's forgiven. Jesus died on the cross for every single sin that you will ever commit, that you have ever committed. There's nothing too bad, too terrible that you can't take back. It's gone. Jesus forgave you. So don't allow the enemy to steal your joy or make you feel guilty because that's not how Jesus works. There's no more condemnation. We are forgiven and you move forward. Just like this scripture says, it says, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. And so I encourage you with that today. And that, trust me, I know, is way easier said than done. Because there are things that I have done where I'm like, are you sure you forgive me for that? Like, do I need to ask a couple more times? But no, forget what's behind you. Move forward and learn from your past mistakes. And just continue forward. Run your race that God has set before you. Be an overcomer. That's my next point is be an overcomer because you're an overcomer. All right? I feel like I'm about to bust out into a Mandisa song when I say that. But I'm not singing for you guys. That oh, Y'all might just exit quickly. But um, this is actually my last point, guys. I can't believe I'm already here. Whew. All right. Well. See, you guys might get to lunch early today. You never know. I, I still talk a lot. <laughs> um, so be an overcomer because you are an overcomer. Um, in Revelation 12, which when I first became saved, I, like, stuck to this verse because people are, were super quick to, like, throw stuff in my face. So I think, I think Trisha read this when she came up and spoke a couple weeks ago. But Revelation 12, um, starting in, or Revelation, yeah, Revelation 12, starting in verse 10. It says, skip the page. It says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser, Oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry. I was reading. I was like, oh, this isn't right. It is. Sorry. <laughs> because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And so what it says in verse 10 is that is that the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown thrown down, but they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Okay, so the reason why I'm reading the scripture to you is because you are a conqueror. You are an overcomer. But how are you an overcomer? 
by the blood of Jesus, by the grace and forgiveness and the work on the cross, and by the word of your testimony, right? So all of this stuff that you have been through in this life, all the stuff that you will go through until the day Jesus comes back or until the day he calls you home, that is your testimony, right? And some of it might, might, might have been really, really bad. Some of it you wish that you never went through. Like when I asked you earlier in the beginning, you know, have you ever asked God why? You know, why you were in the family you were in, why you went through the stuff that you went through? It is your testimony. It is, it is proof and it shows people, shows other believers, shows non-believers that you are maybe telling about, telling Jesus about to them. It shows them, this is all the craziness that I've been through. This is all the craziness that maybe I put myself in. And this is how miraculously God worked it out for me. And so you overcome, you win, you are victorious by those words of your testimony. Not necessarily that you have to sit there and stew in it and be like, I can't believe that I had to live through that. Like, I'm just mad at God because he made me live through that. No. I wouldn't be here if God didn't help me get through that. that that's the way that we need to think about it. Because we've all been through stuff. You know, we're going to continue to, until this life is over, it's going to be hard. But that's your testimony. That shows the power of God in your life. That shows how God has brought you through all this craziness. The good, the bad, and the ugly. God has brought you through it if you allow him to and, or if you lean on him, right? Because there's some people who go through life and they have nothing to do with God and they have no help from God. Well, not that they have no help from God, but they choose not to lean on God. You guys have a source of hope, a source of help, a source of, you know, strength. If you, will, if you lean on him and if you keep trusting in him, even through the bad stuff. So through all of this, all the stuff that I've said today, I want, I want to encourage you guys with this. You know, the stuff that you go through, you can either choose to let it be a stumbling block in your life or you can choose to let it be a stepping stone. Are you going to let it make you falter? And just continue to have anger and resentment and whatever towards all the stuff that you've been through? Or are you going to allow it to push you forward and propel you to what God has for you? Because like I told you those stories of the kids in my class, which I got stories for days. There are four and five-year-olds and six-year-olds in Fort Wayne that have been through stuff that you can't even understand, that they shouldn't have to go through because they're four, five, and six years old. They're, I mean, and it's not just Fort Wayne, it's everywhere. There are little kids who have stories that I will never go through stuff that they've been through, and they're only four years old. And when I think about those little kids, and I think, man, I really just hope that they don't let this situation determine the path for their life that they just continue to move forward and just be strong through all of that stuff. Because when it's right in the beginning of your life, like, it's almost like, well, dang, I just started off bad. My whole life is going to be bad. Like, and so if that's where you're at, like, if you started off bad, it doesn't have to end bad. It doesn't have to end in a bad situation. God can take your mess. And God can take your mistakes, and God can take, because God knew what you were born into. God formed you. God knew who your parents were going to be. But God also is your strength and the person that you can lean on to get through those situations. And so today, as you leave, if you hear anything that I have said, I want you to hear that you guys are overcomers. You are victorious. And you, the way that your life has started or where you're at right now in life, that's not how it has to end moving forward. God has given you victory. God has given you every tool that you need to move forward in life with him. And so my encouragement to you today is to move forward with him. 
Don't allow your past or your past mistakes or anything that you've been through, whether you could help it or whether you couldn't help it, whether it was in your control or it was out of your control. Don't, don't let those things determine where your life is going to lead to. Make a choice today that you are going to take control of the rest of your life and that you are going to allow God to be a part of that life and that you are going to allow God to mold you and shape you and set a path before you that you can run a race for his glory and for his kingdom, just like Paul. Because Paul started out his life what he thought God wanted him to do. He was a knowledgeable man who knew about God. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't blind to God. He knew, who, he knew about God. He believed in God, and he thought he was doing the right thing. But then God set this path before him, and God changed his life. So allow God to change your life and mold you and shape you into the person that he wants you to be. And don't allow those things behind you to change you and change what's ahead of you. Leave the things behind you behind and move forward. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then um, don't leave because we didn't do offering. So let me go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, that you make us new, that you are our creator and that you know every single thing we've ever been through, everything we're ever going to go through. And, God, you know what has been behind us, and you know what is going to be ahead of us. And I pray, God, that you will help us to live for you, to love you, to turn things over to you that we can't control. God, allow us to continue to grow in you, continue to run our race, to just continue to keep moving towards you, towards the prize that you've set before us. God, I pray for every person in here. Lord, whatever they've been through in their life, from the very beginning, God, you've been there. You've never missed anything that has ever happened to us, God. You know exactly where we're at, where we've been. And I pray, God, that we will just turn everything over to you and continue to live for you and to love you and to run after you.